Okay, while um, the panelists are uh, getting ready and coming on to the stage, uh, let me actually start introducing you the, uh, the, the panel topic itself. Uh, it's actually a very interesting topic that everybody's talking about. Even today in the keynote, um, uh, the, the, the chief development officer at Informatica actually touched upon a little bit about it. About, uh, really about, you know, how do you manage the millennials, the people who are born digital, uh, people who are coming into the workforce and the people who just there are not enough good people in the tech industry to hire today, right? That's, a, that's the biggest, biggest challenge that pretty much every company is facing and especially the technology companies are going through. So we will talk about, uh, you know, we heard some stories in the morning, uh, you know, from the leader's perspective, from the executive's perspective, from the business leader's perspective. This panel is going to be more or less very focused on from the HR perspective. Is that even a real problem? I mean, like, is this a problem that is unique? Uh, is this a problem that we haven't seen ever be before? Uh, you know, there are two kinds of thoughts. You talk to some of the enterprises, they say, you know what, we existed in the business for 40, 50 years. We have seen generations come and go. And every time there is a transition between the generations, these kind of a challenges are always uh, talked upon. But the reality is, over a period of time, they're all the same problems. You know, you have to evolve the normal course that you have evolved. Uh, and some people tend to differ. They always think that this is a huge evolution. I mean, like, if you look at the transformation that is going on in the employment between the generations with the digitization, with globalization, and so on and so forth, everybody is starting to think this is a real deal. You have to change the way you do things different than how you have been doing so far, right? So uh, we have a really, really esteemed panel. Uh, very honored to have the panelists here uh, to talk about it. Uh, to start with, uh, I have uh, Britt Sellen, uh, who's the VP of HR at Cloudera, one of the fastest growing startup companies in the Valley. And, uh, and uh, as uh, Britt was saying, they are the unicorn that is still growing. <laughs> Right, and uh, we, uh, 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 um, uh, next we have Mayank Jain, who is the Vice President of Workforce Planning and Analytics at Visa. Uh, so he's going to give us a lot more perspectives in terms of a large company, a global company, a consumer branded company. You know, how do they look at uh, the, the, the next generation workforce? And then uh, we have uh, Juanita Lott, uh, who's the EVP and uh, Chief HR Officer at Epicor Software. And uh, you know, um, and you know, obviously, the, uh, you know, they are going global uh, now. So, and they are San Francisco based, uh, which is one of the hotbeds for attracting this talent. So, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, what Juanita is going to talk about. And then, last but not least, we have Cami Shelmer, uh, who is the Chief Client Officer at Arisent. Arisent is. Um, you know, uh, one of the proud sponsors of, uh, uh, you know, the Confluence. We're very honored to have you as a sponsor. And also a very reputed and a very large services, uh, engineering services company that has global operations. So one of the uh, critical things that we will be talking as we uh, move forward is like, you know, is this a problem only in the Valley? Or is it a problem out in the U.S. or outside as well? So, uh, so with that, let's uh, get started. Um, you know, just to kind of, uh, before we get started on the actual topics, um, uh, Britt, I want you to kind of just give us like a two minute point of view on what do you think? Um, so uh, my view on this is with every population, you have to meet them where they are. Um, and so uh, millennials are different, but in many ways they're not that different. So you just have to be thoughtful about how you're working with your folks. Mayank? Short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is my 90 seconds. I only had two minutes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in my experience, uh, so the way Visa's technology has been changing quite a bit, and we are going through a, fin a pretty uh, phenomenal transformation. And a key aspect of that transformation is changing the workforce and getting a lot more of the uh, contemporary skill sets, if you will, which means millennials. Uh, the way I look at that I have tried to understand the phenomena is uh, what, you know, think of driving a car. So when I used to, earlier, when I came to the U.S. and I had to look at, the, I, you know, we would get in the car if you had to go somewhere, and then we would think, oh, my gosh, I haven't got the map. Okay, and then we would run, try and get the map, directions, so on and so forth. Today, of course, you know, we basically get in the car and we see, okay, now, you know, where are we going? And then we say, okay, well, do I have, you know, how do I pull up the map and things like that. So it's a completely different shift in mindset. It's 
about what we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it. Okay, and that is the way the shift is coming in the new way we work. Uh, and that's what, so yeah, we can speak more about that, but that's how I think about this new generation. Excellent. Juanita? Working with who, what's the relationship look like? Are your systems ready? Did you change your business processes? Can you operate your organization effectively? And does your CEO have a point of view about it? Uh, so that was my two minutes. But that, for me, I think it's the Gen Y question. Tammy? So my perspective would be, um, I think that um, as we move from, and to key off what you said, I think as we've moved the HR function and with it the talent that's associated with that as we've gone from an HR has grown from a personnel department so to speak way back um, personnel management to a full HR function and now to something focused on how do your processes support the focus on talent acquisition talent management and then talent retention and all through, you know, being born with a population that's born digital. Um, those are the yeah, big. Um, with the mic. Okay. So Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. There. Um, with a population that's born digital, um, globally. So it's balancing that and changing HR itself as we progress to. Um, manage the questions and the challenges with um, retaining, getting, retaining, attracting, and challenging millennials. I think it's also balancing what we look at as globally, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, but the challenge of balancing that the local needs versus also being a global organization, and with globalization, how do you, for each of the different um, places in the world, and pockets where we're servicing clients, how do you also cater um, to the local needs? Mm -hmm. Then I think there's also um, just millennials themselves and the fact that um, they're, they're different for different parts of the world, but they also have the same, um, communicate, same needs, communication, transparency, um, cross-functional opportunities, um, real-time feedback we were talking about when we were sitting together before this and so how do you balance all the common needs and focus your programs on and the balance uh, between open communication and the need for confidentiality with clients so I think it's a constant on many fronts current workforce with the millennial workforce and the different needs so it's a constant balancing act is what I think of um, when I think about this topic or challenge that we have in front of us. You know, great. I, I think, you know, uh, thanks for sharing all those perspectives um, uh, to start with. Uh, you know, one thing, anytime we talk about this topic, right, the biggest thing that comes upon is you have to change your culture, right? The millennials expect different culture, right? And they are social, you know, even today we, we, we got like a nine different things that, you know, the companies have to change, whether they have to be a lot more social, they have to be a lot more connected, they have to be a lot more global thinking, they have to be a lot more flexible. You know, but, but the first word that comes to any time you think about millennials is they're culturally they're very different, their expectations are very different. Is that true? I say yes and I say no. I think overall millennials are like where work is going. I think it's all becoming more and more personalized. I think okay. um, the Valley is uh, an example of that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't tell people when to show up. Okay. There's certain core areas that need to show up. We don't tell people what to wear. Mm -hmm. you know, we just hope they wear something. That's always good. <laughs> um, we, you know, they, they get to pick whatever device they want when they start so they can have a laptop or they can have a PC. And so I think this is, my belief is that this is just part of how millennials are expecting to experience the world, right? Mm -hmm. They can go anywhere else. They can personalize it. They can drive for Uber. They can work remotely from some home country if they want to do that. And so part of what we look to do is to find ways to customize as much as we can, right? So okay. an example would be um, for our uh, benefits um, 
everybody does a benefit survey to understand what people want, but we kept getting back that the benefits met people's needs, but they weren't unique. Um, and so we wanted to understand if our assumption of paying, you know, ma making sure that what people paid for their health and welfare benefits was low was the best place. That's where everybody else would put their, um, that's where the population would also put their priorities. And mm -hmm. so we sent out a survey that said, look, you know, you tell us where you want your priorities. Your priorities can be here or there, but basically I have this bucket of money, what do you want to trade for it? And okay. in the end, nobody wanted to trade it. Now, I think, you know, 20 years ago, would I have cared what people said? Probably not, right? I, I, I was gonna get my efficiencies out of where I got my efficiencies. But at the end of the day, if I'm spending the same amount of money and I have a population that says, no, we'd really rather you spend the money here, slightly more work for me, but that's what, what they want, right? So you wanna look for those kinds of opportunities. Uh, what do you think about the culture aspect and the importance of the changing the culture before you start attracting the people? Yeah, and I, so my so my perspective is that so in so the business is changing, okay. So think of Visa very quickly. We have a fantastic business model. We have a network, and you know, with fifty three percent margin, uh, we've been operating and. The there's uptime of the network, and there is, there, there's complete security. It's bulletproof, okay? Now, this whole business model, and this is you know, very prevalent across the board, has to be much more about opening up your business so that other people can play in it as well, okay? Uh, and you know, companies like Visa have a tenured workforce or had a tenured workforce that operated in a certain way. And in order to bring about a change, where the business is going it is almost per force you need to sort of you know you need to inject it with this contemporary ways of doing business from the outside okay and that's where millennials play the part so for us it's almost a little you know i'm going to turn it a little bit which is it's not that you're you have to what do you say you change the culture and therefore you attract the millennials and make them productive it's quite the other way around for us you would make you, you you change the organization structure and you make whatever changes are required in order to attract the millennials, and that in itself that helps you change your culture, in tune with the business. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree same. with what I've, what both my colleagues here said. I would also it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think we were also talking a little bit earlier about the fact for most of us we have a blended culture challenge, which I think is what, what we're saying here. Uh, millennials, yes, are becoming a big portion of the workforce, but for most of us, and I know for my organization, uh -huh. we have a tremendous kind of bubble on the back end. That's where our experience lies. That's where our you know, knowledge, you know, deep product knowledge oh, exactly. lies. And the, the, there's a culture there as sure. well. So I think our, uh, our challenge is to kind of figure out how uh -huh. to how to make those those different cultures that we do define, you know, by looking at what the needs are of Gen sure. Y, and then what are the needs on the back end uh, for those who are baby boomers or Gen X, because our business has to be, uh, you know, I I question how many cultures uh -huh. do we have within the confines of what we call our company, right? So. That's a that's tough. Um, it is. Uh, you know, it's a challenge for um, I think most organizations, um, and I'm just really interested when I hear the perspectives of all you know of the the three guys here on the panel because we are different businesses, different stage, yeah. right? Start up from from startup to forty some odd years around, you know, uh, and so what we need to think about probably is a little different because of that, but okay. fundamentally we come up with one vision as to what's going to be our best bet sure. to take the, the full organization forward. So, Kami, uh, the same question but with a different perspective. Not only the culture between the generations and also you have the added complexity of the culture of various other geographies. Right. So how do you manage those two things? I mean, like, do you change? Um, 
So you do have, I mean, for example, so you, to your, when you said you took the survey, you know, if you look at Asia or you look at the research and you also just ask them, they're interested in a really strong benefits package. Whereas if you go to a Latin American company, I mean country, they're gonna say their, their main, something that's really important to them is a cross-functional opportunity and getting experience across the company. Um, and, op and, and fast pace too. So I think um, the way we've zeroed in on this is to train the managers. There again, you get, um, you referred to it a good way, but non-millennials, managing the millennials. Um, and um, so we focused in on training the managers to educate them and understand millennials, understand the opportunities they're looking for, and train them, so to speak, to manage millennials um, and get a better cultural understanding. So um, that's a little bit of a stretch. Some people adapt to it more easily, but that has been the challenge um, in such a large global organization to get the managers, to get everybody on board to train so that, that millennials are getting what they need and having people be responsive to that. And any subtle differences between various countries that you have seen within millennials or within the workforce? I mean, like, workforce, obviously, there are some differences between various geographic cultures. But have you seen the same kind of difference exist between millennials, say, in US versus in Eastern Europe versus, say, in Asia? You know, besides, so I think, yeah, besides specific things that they key in on or they focus in on, the things um, I've seen, especially with the new population that's just getting out of school, what we refer to as freshers just coming out of college, the greatest worry across the globe is, will I find a job, cost of education? And so um, I do see subtle differences that I already mentioned, benefits and cross-functional, but I think still as a group um, of millennials, the concerns or the things that they're after, flatter organizations, working on teams. Um, I would have to say, and, and yeah. a different perspective, may someone may have that, um, that the concerns are, are similar um, and grouped together as far as what they're looking for and how they're looking to operate Excellent. and what they get out of work. Okay. Um, and what they, they feel like they're adding to society, giving back, and it's meaningful. Got or it. meaningful for them. Uh, my anger. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, so Visa, is, uh, as part of its technology transformation, we've opened a fairly, well, substantial center in Bangalore. And the things that we are seeing, and, you know, I think, and having been in India, so that th this is the nuance that I pick up on. Uh, in the third world, you know, the classic business strategy of planning everything out, putting in a process, and then following the process to achieve success wouldn't work. It was much more of what I think, you know, McKinsey would call the hustle strategy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, in, in India, of course, they call it jugad, okay? Uh, which, in my experience, has been quite the other way around in the US. Now, come in the millennials, their way of working, and I, you know, I described this in the, in, the, in the example of driving the car, you know, figuring out where you need to go, you need a plan. That was the old world. Today, you don't need to have a map, right? Uh, the, the perspective is so much more of, you know, just go and get it done. I don't care as much about the process. I don't care when I get it done. I don't even care as much about the rules, okay? So, and we <laughs> many times have to tamper that down. So that is almost, and I won't say seamless, but let's say the difference for a country like India, as I see, is less. Sure. But for a, for, for a country like the US, culture-wise, it is much more. I mean, that's my experience. Got it. I want to jump off of that. I think a lot of that really speaks to this notion of the technology and the platforms that, uh -huh. that the use globally, globally yeah. are the same. Mm -hmm. They think about it the same. They li And so these gaps, that is the narrowing, you know. And I would totally agree with you. It's no longer the, you know, plan, 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 execute. It's the 
do it quickly, iterate. It's the where's my, you know, the, the reward system has to be that real time as well, right? So I think that's another manifestation of the fact that we are now so driven by the fact that the, yeah, that, that the barriers are going, are gone, right? You know, Mike, let me drill down on one of the comments that, you know, some of the other panelists also picked up on, which is like basically the work for uh, the, the organization structure, especially when you have like what, in your company, three or four, three and a half generations or four generations <laughs> close to? Uh, right? Uh, Sometimes it seems like more than that. <laughs> more than that. So, so yeah. I mean, like, you know, how do you manage between, uh, you know, how do you manage the expectations? And number two, how do you actually come up with the, the organization structure that works across all these generations? Right. Uh, so I'm not sure I quite have the answer to specifically oh, that. Sure, absolutely. Related to that is, you know, what, what did we do in terms of organization structure to one, attract them, and second, to at least try to make it work, okay? So the first part, you know, the, the, based on research that we've done, uh, millennials, the way to attract top technology talent, the first and most important thing was for the millennials to know what kind of technologies are they gonna be working on. Is it the latest cool technology rack, or is it the, you know, legacy systems, which you know really are the bread and butter of Visa? Okay, uh, so that is one. The second thing that we uh, noticed is that, um, based on the organization structure, you know, there was the middle management for the middle management especially to move up. Okay, and even the lower management, uh, it was just not happening. Okay, so we needed to change the organization structure so that we could have them work on the coolest technologies, and I'll tell you why organization structure, and second, how they can, we can credibly show them that they're gonna move up. So we went about, <clears throat> most of our work was actually done, being getting done by our vendors. So all new work that used to happen was being done by our vendors. So the first thing we did is insource. Okay, and while in sourcing, you know, so again, remember I mentioned about the tenure and the, demograph the demographics, it was fairly senior tenured. They would necessarily hire at middle layers because they themselves didn't know the new technologies. For, for them to be able to get work done, they couldn't hire somebody who's very, very junior, right? Uh, and second, they would uh, not necessarily hire from the, uh, from the youngest generation. Okay, so they would, you know, it, it was a self-perpetuating cycle. Old technology begets old technology. So as we insource the work, we also ensure that all our hires, not all, 60 to 70% of our hires were basically from colleges. Okay, which is a huge culture change for these guys. It's huge. We ramped up our college hiring about eight to nine times in a period of one and a half years. Wow. Okay. Uh, now, so, so that is how, you know, because we can tell them, yes, we are working on the latest, you know, the Hadoop, sorry, the Hadoop of the, of the world, and, you know, so on, okay. Uh, as a, okay, and uh, <clears throat> also we can credibly show them that, yes, this is your path. Uh, so that's how, now, you know, how are the managers dealing with it? That is, we are yet to get to. Okay. okay, that is that is a challenge that we are still working on. Uh, Britt, uh, just um, you know, um, shifting the gears uh, on some of the comments that you mentioned that actually caught my um, uh, attention is the personalization of the work. Right, when you talk about the personalization of the work, you know, what does it mean? Well, I think uh, my experience is, and maybe it's just youth, but uh, millennials are very quick to ask for what they want. Okay. Right? Um, and they're very direct about what it is that they want, whether or not it's realistic or, or if it's not realistic. Um, and so you typically know what they want, right? Okay. Um, and this, I think, in a way, just having been in a startup environment um, in the Valley, this is an easier transition for us simply because uh, the way a top tech company works uh -huh. with high level engineers is it's pretty personalized, right? Those super top tech guys, they get to, or women, get to say, I want to do this project, and we say, okay. <laughs> so, um, so as you've got the millennials coming in, you already have sort of a um, experience of trying to personalize as much as possible. And then we just look for ways to make the processes around that personalized that's as well. Does it also include the flexibility? 
yeah. of what they do and when they do and how they do? Yeah, I mean, we expect people to be in with their teams at a certain period of time. But okay. like we, for our engineering teams, they get to work from home all day on Wednesdays because nobody, if you're developers, you don't want to be interrupted all the time. It makes it really hard to create things. Um, we do things like, you know, we have um, uh, our quarterly cloud era conversations, which are not, uh, they're not performance reviews per se. We don't actually give you a rating. Um, but, but our flavor of this is that employees are expected to identify what they've done well, what they should be doing next quarter, what they could have done differently. They're expected to go out and get feedback from the, what I call their work partners, so that could be internal peers or uh, external folks that they work with. Tell this all to their manager. Their manager's job is to verify that this is actually true. And then at the end, they get to ask, you know, the, the part of it is they should be asking for whatever help they want from their manager from a development standpoint, right? Okay. Um, and the difference for this is it's not top down. Not top down. It is the employee is expected to drive the bulk of the conversation, and the manager's job is to validate and help them understand where their, their assumptions are not correct. So that would be an example of what I would say a fairly standard process that is more personalized, right? Okay. I get to talk about what I want. I get to say what I did as opposed to having my manager tell me. So you create your own you goals and you create your own yeah. objectives and you kind of. It doesn't of mean your manager it. doesn't say that's the wrong goal. Yeah, of but course. it means that, you know, we want people to feel like we hired you because you're smart. We hired you because we think you know your job better than anybody else. Okay. And so you tell us what you think you're going to do next quarter or in the next six months. And then your manager will say, yes, that's right or no, that's not right based on their broader view. I can you know, keep on asking n number of questions, but it looks like there is one question, so we will take one question right now. Yeah. Is this on? I appreciate all these discussions on how the millennials, how for us to work with millennials and how to uh, be prepared. I'm curious on your thoughts on how much training or preparedness do you think the millennials require to appropriately interact with other generations? And the second part to that question is which companies or institutions are you aware of that are doing a good job or doing something about it? Because that's one part of the discussion after that I haven't really read any articles or seen any material or content on. Thank you. Anybody wants to take it? Well, maybe just a couple of bullets. I would say that, um, you know, if we use the term freshers, right, you know, the, the new hire millennial, I do think that there is a significant amount of training that's not only required uh, because they don't, you know, while they bring certain uh, requirements to the business, you know, that we've been talking about here, they do not bring any of the business context that we all have to have, right, to operate. So the answer is yes, we do have to have training. The question, um, the, the second part of that is where and how and in what form can you deliver that training uh, so that it's aligned with, again, all of what we see is their unique way of learning, communicating, and all of that, right? Um, it, Personally, and I don't know about the others on the panel, I do not know of an organization that has found the holy grail as to how that works. Um, what I do think is that there are a lot of interesting new startups that are taking small pieces of the, you know, what that next gen solution might look like in an enterprise that are doing some very interesting things that kind of address that. And you know, uh, you know whether it's in a portion of the way we think about hiring or performance or, you know, kind of or on you know whatever part of the you know the spectrum you're talking about. There's some interesting things going on. Uh, uh, I think in the prior conversation, if I could just mention sure. one example, in the prior um, session, there was some discussion around this notion of diversity, right? And uh, you know how we approach issues of getting the most diverse uh, pipeline of Gen Y into our mix, right? And a lot of the way we think about that comes from the way we have thought about creating diversity uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, right? We're going to go out, we're going to enforce, we're going to legislate, you know, we're going to make it happen. Uh, there's a company out there that I'm actually uh, very interested in called Unitive that is taking an approach that's based on a lot of psychological analysis as to what is that core thing 
that happens within an, org within, uh, an organization that's not an intentional uh, uh, dis uh, exclusion of a, of a sex, a race, et cetera, that operates for all of us and what could you build with respect to software that allows you to speak to the broader funnel so you get a broader population and remove this whole notion and, and quite frankly, get to the best talent for the role right through that process rather than taking kind of this, we've got to have X percent, Y percent view. It opens up the process not just for the organization, it attracts in this example, a much broader spectrum on a global basis of millennials into a process that is very, very different than the way we've thought about it historically. You know, one small example of a lot of things that are going on, um, I think, with Thank new you. tech. Uh, there is, looks like one more question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the um, important uh, methods to have con contain attrition is basically to enhance the job competence. And for that, job rotation plays a lot of role in enhancing the competence, like how we do in training. Uh, can you share uh, one or two best practices that you all follow in your uh, individual organizations in terms of uh, uh, job rotation? What are the best practices that you have in terms of job rotation by enhancing the competence of the employees, specifically the millennials? Anybody, I mean, like, you know, this is something that we also have heard from a lot of customer, uh, uh, you know, uh, clients that, you know, millennials look at their career as a tour of duty rather mm -hmm. than as a full-time career, right? I mean, like, they want to work what passionates them, what really interests them. They can get off the work, do some gig economy that uh, Vanita mm -hmm. you are talking about, mm -hmm. or come back again into the workforce. So in those cases, is, you know, is there any model that you guys have created or any best practice to handle it? I will start with you, Kathy. Um, we just implemented a program called My Career Choice. We rolled it out about six months ago, and that was to get us more regimented on strict rotational policies requiring two years, you have a global opportunity, you move somewhere, you service the client, but in two years you, have a, you, you can apply um, not only the rotational policy, but within that two years, if you seek an opportunity or there's something that's offered on the website that you want to apply for, you can go ahead and apply and go through the process um, to be rotated off the client at an agreed upon with the manager at an agreed upon date. Um, and that's been a very popular program because it's allowed them a way, and I won't say anonymously, but to start the process themselves kind of their destinies in their own hands and um, get a different experience or apply and see movement um, sooner if they'd like than two years. We do have the rotational, rotational policy of two years, but it's allowed them an opportunity and then bring the managers into it if they're selected to agree on a transition. So I think for millennials, that's particularly important in that it's given them, they feel like the decision is in their hands. They're kicking off the process and initiating it. So it's been, it's been a good program for us. It's new, but um, over the last six months, people have really gotten excited about that. Anybody else has any other best practice, Mayan? So, so very quickly. So I think one of them is a very traditional best practice, which is really looking at career lattices versus the, you know, just upward movement. Uh, and for that, you know, very similar to that, we have a visa scout. So where we are actively encouraging people to go and, and you know, very similarly, I understand, first of all, what are the kind of competencies required in each of the different types of jobs and therefore people understand where to go. So that's one, you know, which is a generally, I think companies, many companies do that already. The second thing that we're doing is uh, what is called go share. So this is where you can still continue to be uh, in the existing function that you're in, but have a two to three year assignment to go and work in another group. Okay, uh, so that has been very, so I don't have the numbers, I don't remember the numbers, but that has been fairly successful as, as yet as well. Uh, the third thing that our head of technologies has launched is this, and I think it's a concept from Google, which is a 90-10, which is 10% of your time uh, you can work on whatever you want to, to do. You, you can work on, and that is—it's not just on paper. It's not just on, 
that, yeah, you know, <laughs> you have to do 110 <laughs> percent of what you're doing, but actually it is 9810. And uh, uh, I, if I remember, I think last, and I think this was last year, I think almost in the range of 20 to 30 new ideas were actively worked on uh, in the period of one year as a result of that 9010. So I think. Uh, uh, you know, those are the ways that we're trying to uh, bring about career mobility. Uh, so, I mean, like, you know, just um, moving on to, um, you know, other topics, like, you know, one, one of the things that, you know, ca come up, right, America, the millennials are, like, so socially active, and they want to have all the flexibility and everything. And obviously, like, every organization cannot allow that. I mean, like, there are some constraints, whether you know, it's a regulatory constraints in the case of Visa or, you know, member, you know, client constraints in the case of Arisent or, you know, some other constraints because of the either, you know, government regulations or, you know, the industry regulations or so, or so on and so forth. How do you handle that? I mean, like, can you tell them that you cannot talk anything about work outside of work? You want so to start, we, Yeah, we have uh, social policy rules, so to speak, right? That okay. we don't police people. Is there any good example you can give us? Well, people have their own Twitter accounts. They have their own uh, blogs. We have a lot of technical people who write blogs who are very well known in the open source community. And so they have their own life outside of Cloudera. Um, and so um, we just give people parameters. Mm -hmm. And then you have to let it go, right? Okay. Anybody else? For, for us, it's a lot of training. You know, training, training, training okay. on ensuring that, yes, of course, you should write about what you want to write about, and we can't do anything about it. But then know that when you write anything about the company, and especially on the things that you're working on, that you are bound. And it's not just the company, but you also are bound by the various regulatory authorities because it involves uh, all sorts of class action lawsuits and, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? monopolies, you know, act and things like that. So I think that is the one big thing. But the, the other thing is, you know, on that is that we have opened up. I mean, for Visa, this is a big thing. We have opened up things like Chatter. You know, we are ourselves uh, providing social platforms for them to express and for all of us to express what we have in our mind. Uh, within the construct of the company. So, you know, that's a, some, I won't say outlet, but that's a great collaboration mechanism utilizing the concepts of social media. Okay. Go on. Um, Sorry. You know, w one other thing that, you know, keeps coming up is like, you know, uh, you know organizations, that, especially the work environment, uh, has evolved once co companies started adopting like new methodologies like Agile, right? Um, and there are new policies that are coming up in terms of like, you know, bring your own uh, device to work because, you know, that is the coolest thing, whatever the coolest thing you can bring in on. And so, you know, is that something that's sustainable uh, in, a, in, a, in an organization? Or is it like a fad that only the startup companies tend to do it? That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, here's my go, view. Go my, my view is this. Everything's becoming more customized, everything, everything. Okay. And so I think there's a very natural tension between a company that's been in place and is large of, you know, the most efficient way to run that organization is to be very structured about it. Uh -huh. um, but the world's becoming more and more unstructured in terms of what people's expectations are. And so you have to find ways to allow some uh, customization for, for folks because the, the, it's too easy, particularly if you're talking about a tech population, it's too easy that for them to find a job someplace else, right? So if you, didn't, you don't give them enough room to customize things, then it's just a job, just a job. right? Okay. Now, I'd, I'd just piggyback on what Britt just said. Uh, I think that kind of the long term of Gen Y uh -huh. is we're going to have to find different kind of models of work. And if you were to ask me five years, six years down the road, what will it look like? There will be so many more of our workers who aren't in an org structure as we think about it. Right. Uh, won't be working for us in the traditional way, uh -huh. right? Um, I think a lot of the systems will have evolved, hopefully, or will start to evolve to recognize that we have 40, 50 percent or more that are on this, you know, I'm just here for Project X and I'm no longer part of your business, right? right. So by definition, you know, their tools, their access, et cetera, it won't look like what it looks like today for someone who's 
on the payroll, so to speak, right? Is there some, some tools that you are already implementing to enable that? Oh, I wish I was that forward. <laughs> 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 I wish I were there. Um, I, I think we're starting to investigate some of, the, some of the platforms that allow us to interact or to connect, connect. with okay. those populations that we are imagining won't necessarily fit the old model, uh -huh. right? Uh, there are some platforms, for example, that allow you to interact with the networks of networks of employ of candidates, right? Kind of looking at it more from the perspective of tools, for example, um, you know, kind of interacting with the business with tools that are very different than the tools we would sure. normally use for intake. Um, and so being uh, interested in testing some of those tools, okay. you know, is one of the things we're working on. I'm trying to remember some of the names. Um, uh, I like I, this, Sunro, S-U-N-R-O is an interesting platform. Sunro, okay. Uh, it's not a U.S.-based company, but is building out uh, an interesting software kind of uh, Gen Y-focused uh, video slash um, it's just a multimedia uh, owned by the kind of um, the candidate rather than the okay. company and then interacting and being integrated within the, the systems that we have internally. Yeah. Um, and so that particular platform which allows us to get um, in their world, right, the three-dimensional view of who they are as a candidate and kind of going through that first or second interview on that site and then having that data flow, okay, which excellent. is interesting. Now, I wish I could ask a lot more questions because you know this is a topic that we can, I, I know that you think about it every day and I can keep on asking many, many more questions. There's a, you know. uh, in the interest of time, we probably, uh, you know, the, the panelists are here, so you're more than welcome to come and ask them a personal question. Uh, but I really want to thank you all uh, for sharing, uh, you know, some of your thoughts uh, and the best practices. I think more importantly, this is a problem that is going to stay with us. Right? It's not a problem that we can sleep over and say that tomorrow it will disappear. Look, you know, that's for sure. Number two is, I mean, like, there are some very good best practices that the, the panelists have shared with us. I'm pretty sure that you, know, you can go back to your work and think through what they are doing. And I, you know, I'm not saying that everything will work for everyone in, this, uh, in every environment, but I think there are quite a few things that they are doing which are extremely valuable. Uh, so for that, I, again, once again, I really, really appreciate all your time and. Uh, and, and coming here and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is small.